the thumbs up. So welcome back here at EHSM, uh, this time with Harald Welte and his Osmocom project. Well, welcome everyone, and uh, thanks for the organizers of EHSM to invite me to present to you today. Um, the topic of my presentation is Osmocom, um, which is uh, an abbreviation for Open Source Mobile Communications, in case you've always wondered what that might be. Um, Osmocom is a project uh, that is an umbrella project um, over a variety of different um, free software, open source software, and open hardware projects in the area of mobile communications. Um, some of you may have heard of, uh, about some of the projects which are more uh, commonly uh, known, such as Osmocom BB, our um, baseband uh, protocol software, but there are many, many other sub-projects under this umbrella uh, within the Osmocom project, and I'd like to give an overview about what we are doing um, and which areas we're working in, and also uh, show you a little bit about uh, one of our hardware projects, which you can see on uh, the right-hand side. So this is, uh, as I said, mainly an overview about the different activities within the project. There's a slide about myself, uh, maybe just uh, two or three sentences. Um, I'm, um, how could you say, a... a <clears throat> uh, systems level uh, uh, geek, so I'm, I, I enjoy software that's as close to hardware as possible. Anything that's uh, related to user interface or uh, is interpreted or scripting languages uh, sounds like an abomination to me. It has to be on bare iron, otherwise it's not really uh, something I would get excited about. I've been doing um, kernel and bootloader development for quite some time. Um, also looked a lot uh, at network security. Um, and uh, have been involved with the NetFilter IP tables packet filter that's part of Linux since 2.4. Um, I also do electrical engineering. That's actually my background um, uh, uh, by training, and I'm always looking for interesting communication systems, interesting protocols that are not so well known. So I've been doing research in areas like RFID or DECT or GSM or other uh, uh, systems that uh, don't receive as much attention as uh, other systems do. And to illustrate that, I would like to um, quickly uh, have a look at how uh, research, uh, both, uh, let's say, academic research as well as independent research works in the TCP IP Ethernet world, where, well, basically, if you want to, if you have some bright idea how to improve the TCP congestion control or uh, something related to the TCP IP protocol stack, all you need really is, well, you need some off-the-shelf standard hardware, an x86-based uh, system with an Ethernet card, um, uh, fairly ubiquitous these days. Um, you can start with any of the open source implementations of those protocols, such as uh, Linux or uh, uh, BSD operating systems. You can add in instrumentation to, the, uh, to that code. Um, you can make your proposed modifications. Um, you can do some testing, performance evaluations, and so on. You've, in case you're scientific, you write a paper, you publish the results, and you're done. Everything you need in order to actually do applied practical research is already there. You don't really need to you know, build an Ethernet card or write a TCP IP protocol stack or something like that because all that is there as multiple um, open source implementations. Now, if we look at mobile communications uh, back a couple of years before Osmocom uh, came around, it was a pretty a different situation because none of the protocols on none of the interfaces of none of the network elements have been implemented as open source before. Um, and you would find almost no university on this planet that has a test lab uh, with the equipment that's required to actually uh, uh, do any kind of research on those protocols and on those systems in an applied manner. Um, and even if they do, there are uh, some universities like uh, a technical university in Dresden here in Germany which has all a complete mobile communications network because they get funding from Vodafone, but then it's all black boxes, right? You have all these black boxes, they implement all the functionality, they implement all the protocols, all the interfaces, um, but you cannot really modify anything. It's all just, uh, uh, you know, use it or, or switch it off, but you can't really um, can change a couple of configuration settings, but it's not really that you could modify uh, something in, in this equipment. So the only way in order to do some research, be it security related or be it whatever uh, uh, interest you have, uh, is you partner with a commercial company that uh, builds products or uh, technology uh, uh, blocks for, for products in the mobile communication area. 
and then you have to sign NDAs and you cannot publish uh, uh, the software and everything that you have written and uh, uh, they of course want exclusivity uh, to profit from the results that you have been doing. That's sort of the very unfortunate um, situation. And if you look at the implications of that is that, <clears throat> well, um, on, on a theoretic side, the protocol specifications for the internet world, the TCP, IP, Ethernet, Wi-Fi, um, you know, all the protocols that people use in the internet world, um, they are uh, public standards. You can, uh, you can obtain them, uh, most of them free of charge, especially today. Um, and you can study them and you can understand them and you can, can uh, discuss or uh, research uh, in theoretic. A manner. The same is true for the GSM and 3G and, and all the mobile communication protocols, but almost nobody does it. All the specifications are public, um, everything is there, everything can be uh, accessed freely and, and uh, read freely without having to pay any fees or without any registration, anything like that. Um, and if you look in terms of users, number of subscribers or number of users, you will find that there are billions of users that use the internet and you will also find there are billions of users that use uh, mobile communications uh, like GSM or 3G systems. Um, so we have two extremely widely deployed technologies where the underlying protocols and specifications are publicly released. but. Uh, there's a huge difference in terms of uh, uh, research and innovation that's happening where on the internet basically anyone can, uh, can become an innovator and anyone can, uh, can create new uh, systems, new protocols or uh, improve existing ones. Whereas in, um, in the mobile communication world that is restricted or has been restricted to very, very few companies. Um, uh, uh, like Qualcomm or uh, Nokia Siemens Networks or Ericsson and so on, who have uh, a very long-standing uh, uh, involvement in this technology and who are making it actively difficult for others to uh, be able to innovate that. Also, we only have very, very few closed source proprietary implementations of, of the protocol stacks um, in use and uh, we have never any publicly we never have any intentionally re released documentation on any of the hardware that's used in such systems. So it's very, very different. Let's assume you want to build a, a PC um, and you want to build a mobile phone. Right? For the PC, uh, it's relatively easy to, to go to the manufacturers and get the, uh, you know, the data sheets for, for the chipsets, for the CPU and so on. Um, not, I'm not talking about the software side. It's relatively easy for the hardware side um, if you want to build hardware to get uh, uh, that information. Somebody's shaking his head. We can, we can have a discussion later on. It's relatively easy in a sense that all you need to do, wait, there are NDAs that you have to sign and so on. I'm not doubting that. But you can get access to the information and there is, you don't have to be a member of a secret club and you don't have to put $10 million on the table before you actually ever uh, be, are, are uh, uh, getting into contact with somebody whom you, um, uh, whom you can interact with. Whereas in the mobile world, if you're talking about uh, baseband processes and baseband chipsets, um, these components, they're not sold on the open market. They're not off-the-shelf standard products that you can buy from electronics distributors. You can't go to DigiKey or to, to Farnell or to any of these and, and, and buy those components. Um, and if you want to buy the components and, and build systems based on those components, you have to uh, become eligible to, to be a, a customer of, of Qualcomm or the respective companies. And in order to do so, a lot of money has to change hands and you have to guarantee that you will in the end buy hundreds of thousands of millions in quantity because otherwise um, you're not interesting to them as a customer. So it's a very extreme um, uh, uh, situation and a very uh, strange market uh, from my point of view, at least different from, from all the other parts of electronics markets that I have seen. So let's say you are a mobile phone manufacturer and you actually have the money and the contacts to become a member of the club and to be eligible to become a customer of Qualcomm or uh, uh, ST Ericsson or any of these companies that manufacture chipsets there. Um, well, even then you only get very limited access to hardware documentation um, and you also uh, typically only get limited access to the source code of the software that runs on the chip. So basically you get a lot of binary firmware and you get uh, 
you know, the pinout of the chip and PCB routing guidelines and that kind of stuff, but you don't really get information about how to program that chip because you get the chip with all the software and you're just supposed to use it as a black box uh, in, in terms of hardware and in terms of software. Um, so uh, even mobile phone manufacturers don't really have a very good knowledge about what is really happening in their products. You know, they understand how they interconnected the chips, which GPIO pins they use for what uh, functionality. They may understand things on the user interface level. They may understand how uh, to run the calibration and the factory testing uh, in, in the production line, but they don't really understand the detailed um, uh, inner workings of uh, what they're actually building there. And uh, particularly not, I mean, not, not on the RF side, when you think about demodulation, uh, decoding, error correction, and that, uh, but also much higher up uh, any of the, uh, the, the protocols that uh, they're running on these processes, on, on these um, baseband processes, they're all closed source implementations and uh, uh, the phone manufacturers don't really get involved with that. Now, on the manufacturing side of network equipment, that's fairly similar as well. Um, so the base stations for mobile networks uh, and other equipment up to the core network for mobile uh, networks is, uh, there are very few companies that build such equipment. It's uh, today basically only Ericsson, Nokia Siemens networks, Alcatel Lucent and Huawei, where Alcatel Lucent is already dead anyway <coughs> as well and um, NSN is struggling to die, so um, uh, in, in terms of uh, the biggest players, it's really just Ericsson and Huawei these days. Um, there are a couple of other manufacturers for small cells, picocell, nanocell, whatever is the, the buzzword of the day for, uh, uh, well, small cells, basically, um, and for measurement devices, and as well, of course, for uh, law enforcement and uh, surveillance uh, equipment, there are uh, small manufacturers but uh, those are, of course, a very special purpose. And only operators buy equipment from them. It's not really sold on the open market. You can't just go to Ericsson and say, oh, I want to have this or that product, and I want to have one of them. There's no way. They want to sell you thousands, and if you're not an, uh, a GSM operator, they will not even send, uh, sorry, they will not even sell anything to you. So, um, again, a very uh, unfriendly uh, market for people who want to uh, have fun with technology. Um, and just one note on, on operators as well. Um, when uh, some people perceive mobile operators as technical companies, um, I think that uh, couldn't be more wrong today um, because operators really are banks uh, and nothing else today. Um, because at least if you look at Western Europe, um, operators outsource you know, the network planning, the network deployment, the network servicing, everything is outsourced. Sometimes even the network operation is outsourced. And they even outsource the billing in, in the last decade or so, so they don't even write invoices themselves anymore. So it's basically an entirely virtual company. Um, everything has been outsourced to somewhere else, and um, uh, there's not much uh, in-depth technical stuff uh, at, at the operator, and they are sort of becoming very dependent on the equipment manufacturers. If you go back in history of mobile communications, then the operators have been very powerful and the governments have been very powerful in uh, the specification of those systems. GSM was specified in the late 1980s, you know, before the wall came down. We still had the Cold War. Um, uh, we still had government-owned telecommunications monopolies and so on. So there has been a quite different uh, distribution of power at that time in the market. And uh, today, this has completely shifted. Most operators are not even actively participating in the standardization process anymore, in, in the research at all. Um, it has all shifted to the equipment manufacturers, like Ericsson or Nokia Siemens Networks. They are basically deciding what to do and how to do it. And uh, then uh, they deploy it at the operator, and then they get the servicing contract, and they decide when an equipment is broken and needs to be replaced, uh, which they then sell uh, uh, to the operator. So it's a, a fairly interesting um, uh, situation, let's say. Ericsson is, is selling equipment uh, to, to uh, you know, whatever, may it be Vodafone, may it be T-Mobile, whatever name. Uh, and at the same time, then they also take care of the servicing and, uh, you know, if something is broken, then they make more money uh, because they sell another device. Um, I think it's a quite a bit of conflict of interest, but that's not the topic for today. So, why is GSM interesting at all from, you know, from a security point of view or from a hacking point of view, uh, more in a hacking as in creative use of technology point of view? Well, <clears throat> 
Um, listening to phone calls, I personally perceive is very boring. Um, I'm never have never really been interested in that. That's you know all the press and media and everyone seems to be focused on that. I think it's boring. Um, but uh, if you think of machine-to-machine -machine communication, then I think you can get an idea of why uh, this is a very important topic. Uh, you know, we have uh, BMW cars for many years that have GSM modems built inside. Other car manufacturers are uh, doing that as well, where you can, for example, unlock the car um, remotely. Um, it goes so far as uh, uh, in BMW, as far as I know, they can even do remotely uh, remote firmware updates of engine control units over GSM. Uh, that's already the, the point where we have arrived um, in, in terms of technology. We have lots of burglar alarm systems. We have smart metering. We have uh, the very uh, exciting railway GSM system, which I bet almost nobody in here or nobody in here will ever have heard about. Has, did anyone hear about GSMR before? Oh, oh, oh. That's surprising. Um, <laughs> that's, huh, sorry? CMU 200, okay, well, so you've seen it on the measurement device, yeah. Um, well, there's a system called European Train Control uh, System, ECTS, no, ETCS? Uh, anyway, I forgot the acronym, but uh, it, it's based on uh, railway GSM, and it's uh, used to uh, control uh, trains. So for example, when does a train have permission to enter a certain part of a track? And it's a, it's a unified system. It's the only unified system across European borders, and it's uh, therefore mandated for all the trains that cross borders in Europe. And uh, it has additional authentication layers uh, uh, on top of what GSM provides. But interestingly, there are some messages that are exempt from those uh, additional authentication messages. And my favorite is the unconditional emergency halt message, which um, uh, I always daydream about. Hmm, why are all these protesters when there are these castor nuclear transports? You know, they could just send an unconditional emergency halt to the train, but may maybe not to that type of a train. Um, OK. Uh, we have vending machines that report when their coin box is full. So if I'm a thief, of course I would want to see those messages and go there and, because I know, oh, you know, the coin is full so I can get the cash now. Um, it's more efficient to steal at the right point in time. And then we have things like uh, uh, power plants, uh, windmills, uh, um, and so on. Uh, which uh, supply power into the electric grid, and quite often um, uh, the control over uh, whether they uh, currently supply power into the grid or not is again done by a GSM modem, um, uh, uh, which uh, uh, then receives some messages. So if you think about the consequences of all these uh, M2M applications, uh, then of course it's uh, uh, much more important than uh, just somebody listening to a phone call uh, uh, when I call my grandmother on her birthday. So um, transaction numbers for electronic banking are also one of my favorites. It's, uh, you know, I, I have absolutely no idea why anyone would ever assume that mobile networks are even remotely more secure than the internet. Um, you know, they are, to the contrary, they are not. You know, nobody would, uh, would want to do uh, online, uh, uh, so if, you, if you're on the internet and you use SSL, HTTPS, then you, today you have decent ciphers, you know, you have uh, uh, decent encryption methods. Of course, there are all kinds of other security-related problems, but just trans sort of translating the security level of GSM and SMS uh, onto internet terminology would be if in 2012 we were still using 40-bit RC4 encryption to use HTTPS. Right. And now banks are sending transaction numbers over, uh, over uh, SMS because they think that's more secure than the internet, which um, of course is a very interesting idea. And some banks now even block uh, the mobile banking websites from the phone because they claim, well, on the phone you can receive the SMS and uh, you can access the online banking. So uh, it messes up their two-factor authentication idea. So they prevent you from using their banking website on the smartphone. But then, you know, if you have a GSM modem in your laptop, it can also receive SMS messages. So, um, well, but then um, you have to put up with a lot of crap. Um, yeah, okay. Getting a little bit away from this uh, security uh, background, uh, just as, a, as an idea of what was the motivation. Now, what did we do in order to uh, be able to, to play with this technology, to implement it ourselves, uh, to explore uh, uh, security aspects and so on? 
Well, we needed detailed knowledge on the architecture and protocol stack, which, as I said, all the information is out there. You just have time, and you have just have to have time and, and uh, an ability to, to consume lots of documents in, in a short amount of time. Um, if you look at the GSM specifications, it's multiple thousands of PDF files, each having a couple of hundred to uh, thousands of pages. But then a lot of it is boilerplate and cross-references and, uh, and, uh, and so on. So it's the, the difficult part is finding out what is where. <clears throat> you need to find suitable hardware because there is no device that you can buy which is a simple physical layer or medium access control layer to uh, uh, those interfaces. So when you buy a mobile phone or when you buy uh, a mobile base station, they implement the entire protocol stack, or at least many levels of the protocol stack, and all that you really want normally is just, from, from a security point of view, is something like an Ethernet card, you know, which just transmits and receives packets, and you can transmit or receive anything. You can modify each and every bit of what you transmit. You uh, want to see uh, what happens if you send messages that are not well formed, that violate specifications, and so on. And uh, then, of course, a free and open source uh, implementation. And in, <coughs> in the Osmocom, excuse me, in the Osmocom project, um, we did that um, for both the network side and the telephone side. I'm going to skip some slides here because I think they're not so uh, relevant here. Um, so on the uh, network side, uh, the difficulty is being able to obtain equipment um, in a sense that the uh, base transceiver stations for GSM typically uh, weren't that easy to find, um, uh, but uh, the, the protocols uh, that you are used to speak to those uh, base stations are fairly standardized. So if you get access to the hardware, um, based on the specification, it's relatively easy in a couple of months uh, to uh, uh, do something useful with it um, if you get access to the equipment. Um, so, uh, and that's where we started on the networking side. We started uh, reading the specs. We got a couple of such base stations from eBay. Luckily, there was uh, somebody who, who sold a couple of old ones. Um, uh, then, um, tried to get actual protocol traces to not only have the theoretic uh, uh, specifications, but to have some real world protocol traces and then start to write uh, the, the protocol stack. And uh, finally, after that has been implemented, we could uh, start to play with uh, security research. And um, this is basically what has become the OpenBSC project. So if you ever heard about OpenBSC, then that's uh, uh, the network side implementation of the protocols. Um, whereas on uh, the telephone side, uh, we also have a project which is called Osmocom BB, the, the open source mobile communications baseband processor, which then is, as the name implies, is, is a member of the Osmocom uh, family, and uh, uh, this is also where I introduced the Osmocom project at this point in the presentation. Um, it, it's, it gathers a number of uh, creative uh, uh, people who want to explore uh, all kinds of uh, strange um, uh, protocols and communication systems. Um, we are a typical uh, open source project in a sense that we have a, a, a website, we have a wiki, we have uh, Git repositories, we have mailing lists, um, we meet on IRC. Um, we now have a, an annual uh, developer meeting um, as well. And uh, so far, I mean, as I said, it started with this uh, base station controller for GSM network side, then we continued with the uh, GSM telephone side, Osmocom BB. But now we have sub-projects working on uh, Tetra was, was uh, the, the uh, digital trunk radio. Um, we have a project for uh, Turaya satellite telephony um, and uh, for many other communication systems. And it's, it's a lot of fun to sort of conquer uh, more and more of these uh, systems that uh, are generally not so well understood. So OpenBSC, I already explained uh, sort of what it does. Uh, you, you get one of these base stations or multiple of them. Um, you, you run OpenBSC and then you can run your own mobile network um, without any additional components. This has been running uh, for quite some time, both in, in uh, let's say, hacker conferences like uh, the, the uh, Hacking at Random event or uh, at the annual CCC Congress. Right now at the 29C3 in Hamburg also there is again a private uh, GSM network running on OpenBSC. Um, but we also have commercial users by now, which is quite fun. 
This is a picture of the first test installation that we had in outdoor environment. This is, uh, you can see some base stations at the bottom of a tree here, actually, and then some cables going up and uh, two antennas, uh, patch antennas mounted with uh, tape, red tape, haha, <laughs> uh, no pun intended, um, uh, at the tree. And uh, it was broadcasting nicely and uh, we had a, a PC operating the, uh, um, uh, the OpenBSC on top uh, with that. We expanded a little bit more into uh, GPRS uh, and edge uh, functionality by implementing the respective network entities that are required for that. Uh, in case you know about mobile networks, you will have heard about SGSN and GGSN before. Um, and um, then with certain, certain BTS, certain base station types, we also can have packet data uh, communications now. Um, this is not production ready yet. It's <coughs> still in a, in a more uh, experimental mode. Um, unlike the uh, GSM side, which is uh, production ready. Now, Osmocom BB, the uh, uh, telephone side uh, GSM implementation, is basically a, a, a firmware implementation of uh, what needs to be running on the baseband processor of a mobile phone. Um, and um, this means that we, we use a, a standard phone, one specific model or one specific series of phones that all use the same chipset. Um, you can see a, a PCB picture of such a phone uh, here at the bottom. Um, and instead of the proprietary software that runs on the baseband processor uh, as it ships from the manufacturer, we have our own code um, that can use uh, the phone hardware to access mobile networks. And of course, uh, once you have your own software implementing uh, you know, layer one, layer two, layer three, and all the, the other functionalities of the protocol stack, you can start to behave different than a normal phone. So for example, you can, uh, there are some methods how, uh, how a mobile network can uh, localize the position of, of a phone. Um, and uh, a lot of these are based on timing analysis. And uh, you can just offset your timing artificially to appear to be further away or closer to a, a cell tower once you have control over the hardware. So um, you, can, you can evade such uh, methods uh, very easily once you have uh, an, uh, your own software running on, on the baseband processor. You can play with the timing. Um, you can, of course, uh, base your cell selection on, on different criteria. You can do um, network scanning and do some uh, statistics-based um, uh, indication of whether or not there might be an IMSI catcher. So uh, people have been uh, working on an IMSI catcher catcher by which you can catch IMSI catchers. I wonder if somebody then thinks about the IMSI catcher catcher catcher, but that's not our problem in that case. So, um, and this has been used now by a lot of, uh, as well as OpenBSC, it has been used by a lot of universities to do you know, the more academic type of research or uh, simply to, to train uh, students uh, to have some practical lab exercises about uh, mobile communications uh, as opposed to just textbook-based training. So what we had to do here is a lot of reverse engineering and a lot of bare iron uh, development uh, to, to drive all the, the analog and digital peripherals inside and then to implement uh, those protocol stacks, as I said, but it has been a, a very fun uh, project to work on. And also, the, the good part is you don't need any special, expensive, whatever hardware. If you want to explore uh, uh, mobile communications technology, then all you need is a, a $20 phone that you can buy on eBay um, or on other sources, and a cable that costs, I think, 8 to 12 euros or something like that to connect it to your PC. And then you need Osmo Com VB, which is free software. So for something like 30 euros uh, maximum investment, um, you can uh, explore all the different protocol layers and uh, um, uh, do research and have uh, practical exercises uh, related to mobile technology. Um, Osmocom Tetra was then a project we started for um, uh, just receiving only um, and doing eavesdropping on Tetra networks. Um, not sure if everyone knows what Tetra is. It's uh, terrestrial trunk radio. Um, system which is used by uh, public services and police uh, and other uh, often public uh, users um, as a trunked radio system. So it's, it's not a cell phone system, it's trunked radio, um, uh, similar to, or you could say a descendant of, of old walkie-talkie uh, type uh, radio. Um, and uh, Tetra is used also by 
uh, a lot of uh, companies like airports, for example, for uh, communication between the staff at airport quite often. Uh, a number of uh, public transportation companies use Tetra as communication. Also utility companies, Vattenfall, for example, here in Berlin operates uh, their own Tetra network. Um, uh, and uh, in the uh, Hamburg, for example, in the harbor, in the container harbor, you will find users of, of Tetra technology. So it's a professional trunk radio system that's used both in public and private sector. And uh, we have a software-defined radio implementation of the physical and Mac layer. And then uh, we, uh, thereby we can intercept the radio interface and then feed all the frames into uh, Wireshark, where we also have uh, um, uh, created the dissectors uh, um, uh, based on some existing work of a Chinese university. Um, and uh, by using this Osmocom Tetra, we can now uh, uh, look at these uh, Tetra networks. The public ones in Germany are all using uh, uh, two layers of encryption, uh, both air interface encryption and end-to-end uh, -end encryption, so you won't really see much uh, aside from management uh, uh, information there. Um, However, uh, in the private networks, I've not seen any private network that uses encryption at all. So um, you, can, you can go to any airport and you can listen to what all the communication on, on the field, it's, it's all completely unencrypted, you know, and then they think about, you know, patting people down and, and uh, tightening security controls, and then uh, if somebody wants to get a picture of what's happening, uh, all you have to do is to listen into Tetra. Um, also, uh, as I said, um, uh, he, uh, public transportation companies here in Berlin, for example, the Berlin subway uh, uh, is using Tetra for communication between all the, the cars um, and, and uh, the, the management and also the actual uh, switching. So uh, it, in, in German it's rangieren, in, in English it really is called switching, which, well, the switching of cars and engines and so on. So that kind of activity is all coordinated um, by Tetra. So you sometimes hear somebody, oh, 10 meters, 5 meters, 2 meters, stop, <laughs> you know, just for moving around uh, uh, vehicles. And since they're not using any encryption and not using any authentication, of course, as soon as you're able to transmit, you can also have fun in talking with these people which we haven't implemented fully for a variety of reasons. Um, then another fun project is um, the GMR project. GMR is a, another European uh, standard, standardized by ETSI, the European Telecommunication Standardization Institute, which also has created GSM and has created TETRA. And uh, GMR, Geomobile Radio, is basically GSM for satellites. So it's 90% uh, you know, GSM system plus uh, some modifications for using it over a satellite link. And this is the protocol or the standard that's underlying uh, the Thuraya um, uh, satellite telephony network. Not sure if you've heard of this. It's um, uh, one of the um, yeah, uh, satellite telephony systems that you can use. Now, Osmocom GMR implements a software-defined radio-based uh, radio modem, uh, physical and, and Mac layer, again, for the receive side only. Then there are Wireshark dissectors and um, even a reverse-engineered implementation of their own proprietary uh, uh, closed encryption, which was, again, <coughs> uh, well, as weak as the, the GSM one, and no surprise, since it's a GSM-derived system. Um, so, using Osmocom GMR, you can uh, and a suitable antenna, maybe an external amplifier uh, and, and some software-defined radio hardware, you can eavesdrop on those systems. And the funny part about eavesdropping GMR is that every phone sends its GPS position unencrypted as part of the first message of every mobile originated call. Um, I was interviewed about this once and I called it the, the let's shoot Gaddafi feature. Um, and uh, literally, there's no other purpose. There's no technological reason why this is in the system. There is no, absolutely no reason except that it has use for intelligence services. I cannot think of any other reason why in this uh, satellite telephony system. A te laziness? laziness? Mm -hmm. oh, why? Uh, if you're lazy, then you don't even put a GPS receiver in the phone. You know, that's, that's the most lazy thing you can do. It saves cost, it saves complexity, it saves battery lifetime. Um, there's no need for the satellite to, to have a, an exact uh, information about the position of the phone. 
It needs to know in which spot beam the phone is located because it has lots of spot beams that uh, point down on the planet. But then based on the satellite knows where it receives the signal from. So it knows in which spot beam the phone is. Um, and that is sufficient for operation of the system. Uh, the GPS position is not. It's, it's a pure artificial uh, um, added uh, gimmick. Um, and then uh, also what's funny is that if you're making a mobile originated call from such a satellite phone, the uh, B number, the number that you are calling, the destination phone number, is uh, also transmitted as part of the first message which is unencrypted. You know? They actually have encryption in the system, and almost all other signaling is done, and, and, and transmission of speech is done over their weak but existing encryption. But the actual number you're dialing is again, part, together with the position, part of the first message you're sending up to the satellite. So this means that without breaking any encryption, anyone who has, uh, uh, can, can listen to the air interface know exactly who is being called and from where is he being called. And that's, of course, very useful. And if you look at the inter uh, surveillance market, the interception equipment market, then for many years you can find companies selling uh, signal intelligence software for uh, uh, you know, government users where you have a nice map of the world and you get red dots where the phone calls are being made and who is being called from there. Um, and um, yeah, that's, uh, uh, as, so the only thing which is really difficult about uh, intercepting um, Turaya or GMR is the speech codec, because the speech codec is proprietary. There's no specification on how the speech codec works, and you cannot really buy any chip or any implementation um, uh, you know, in a single instance or something. So yes, if you're a handset manufacturer, then maybe you can buy a couple of thousand or 10,000 of these uh, chips or something like that, but it's not possible to license even a proprietary implementation of that voice coding. However, some people have made progress in uh, uh, reverse engineering Tektra phones and uh, DSP code inside, so that's no longer really a problem anymore anyway. But uh, it has been the most challenging part really is it was the speech coding. <coughs> yeah. No, yeah, this, oh, so, sorry, yeah, the question was whether the sender ID, the, uh, the, the originating number, uh, is also part of that. No, it's not part of it, but there is some other identity. I'm not sure which, uh, as another identity that refers to the sender, but not the phone number. Because in all GSM-style telephone systems, the phone really never knows what phone number it has. And the phone never sends its own phone number over the network. Um, because it doesn't really know and doesn't have to know what is its phone number. The phones are in, inside the network. The phone identifies itself with the IMSI or the TIMSI or other identities which are specific to the phone or specific to the SIM card, um, but uh, not really by its own phone number. So the phone number you wouldn't see in, in that case. So even in a GSM network, when a GSM phone makes a phone call and uh, there is no encryption or you break the encryption, then you will see only the called number in the call setup, who is he calling, but not the originating number. And the originating number is inserted only in the core network in the mobile switching center when the call is uh, switched from the mobile network to wherever it's going um, to. But you have, as I said, you have some other identity that, uh, uh, but it's not the phone number. Okay. Um, DECT, Digital European Cordless Telephony, is already quite a couple of years ago that there have been a number of publications about uh, security issues in, in, in DECT, uh, which is the most prominent uh, system for cordless phones uh, in, in Europe, at least in some other countries as well, but very Europe-centric. Um, uh, unrelated to Osmocom.org, a couple of years ago uh, we have uh, started the Detected.org project, which uh, started with protocol analyzer and, and interception capabilities uh, for uh, DECT. Um, Osmocom DECT now is uh, not a, um, an eavesdropping or um, protocol sniffing implementation, but it's an actual end node implementation. So with the right DECT hardware and Osmocom DECT, uh, uh, you can uh, actually behave like a DECT base station and you can uh, then connect this to asterisk or something like that. And you can, you can uh, use regular DECT phones and have them communicate with your, 
PC, why all, again, all the protocol processing and, and uh, speech transcoding and everything that's related to the actual system is done in software on uh, your Linux PC as opposed to any firmware or other proprietary implementation. There's also a project about the APCO 25 or Project 25, which is a professional mobile radio system similar to Tetra, um, which is used in the United States. Uh, there's always this, if you look in communication, there is always this, um, well, the Europeans have one system and the Americans have one system and the Americans cannot use the European system and vice versa because everyone tries to subsidize uh, their own industry and then Japan has their own system as well because they don't like to have any uh, foreign systems anyway. So um, you see that a lot, um, in, not just in, in, in professional mobile radio, but even in cellular technology. If you go back a couple of years, you know, the United States was all CDMA and Europe was all GSM. And uh, it's only in the last couple of years that there have been these global uh, systems where Everything is uh, the same, any, independent of the continent you're in, but the frequency bands are still different. Um, and then, uh, yeah, you have some problems. And with LTE, I think, what was it, was 17 or 21 frequency bands? So if you want to have a device, you know, I have an LTE device, great. But, oh, it only supports three of, out of those 20 bands. So you can imagine how many countries it will work and how many it will not work. Um, okay. One of the hardware-related projects that we were looking at, um, uh, or that we were doing, is uh, the Osmo SDR, where a lot of the software projects that we did before, they all require some type of software-defined radio hardware. I mean, it's, it's, it's nice and well that you can do signal processing and, and uh, these kind of things in software, and you don't have to do them in hardware anymore, but in the end, you need some kind of hardware device to interface the radio uh, uh, waves. And, uh, well, there have been, when we started with Osmo SDR, there were basically two popular choices. Um, one of them was uh, the USRP family, which is great hardware, but also, well, um, it's affordable, but not affordable to everyone. Let, let me phrase it like that. Um, so you can get started with like 800 to $1,000, which many people can afford, but still many people probably do not want to or um, cannot afford. So um, the other alternative that was existing uh, already at that time was the so-called FunCube dongle, which is a, uh, a proprietary hardware design um, by, uh, from, from somebody in the UK amateur radio community. Um, it's a very nice, very small USB dongle that you can plug into your PC, um, uh, but uh, it only has 96 kilohertz of bandwidth, which makes it interesting for analog amateur radio applications, but um, all of the professional or commercial communication systems that uh, we are interested in, like GSM, Tetra, and so on, uh, Tetra actually has a smaller band with GSM, GMR, uh, 3G, and so on, they all have wider bandwidth, so you cannot uh, receive it with that hardware. So what we did is this Osmo SDR, which is basically a small silicon tuner. Um, I'm moving the mouse cursor over here. Well, where is the silicon? Whoops. Uh, silicon tuner. Silicon tuner is here, basically underneath the hand. It's a small silicon tuner um, that can receive anything between 64 megahertz and 1.9 gigahertz. That's the specified range. In reality, you can tune it even outside and will still work, but the manufacturer says only up to 1.9 gigahertz. Um, and then we have uh, an analog digital converter here, um, which um, actually, yeah, I don't have a slide here. I <coughs> forgot what, uh, so it's a, it's a 12 bit uh, ADC, two channel for I and Q, of course. Um, that, that tuner is direct IQ down conversion into, into analog baseband. We have these trumpets here, so you can plug actual um, electrical filters in between in the, in the baseband. So if you wanted to do some filtering, you can, you can plug a, a, a daughter board on top of it uh, that does filtering in, in the baseband before you go into the ADC. And from the ADC, we go into, the, uh, into a small FPGA, which is not, really, it's not doing any signal processing. Um, the FPGA is just doing uh, reformatting of the serial sample stream uh, in a way that it can be dealt with by uh, the microcontroller, which we use here, which is a SAM3U an Atmel uh, uh, Cortex-M3 based microcontroller with a USB 2 high speed capable um, uh, device interface here on the other side. So using this hardware, um, 
you can uh, receive up to uh, 4 megahertz of uh, bandwidth of any signal from 64 megahertz to 1.9 uh, gigahertz, um, which is uh, very convenient, and uh, the pricing is uh, more in the, I think, what was it, 170 euros or so that we are uh, offering it for now. So, and of course, uh, people can build it themselves as well, but uh, that's sort of the pricing. So much cheaper than the USRP, but at the same time still very capable in terms of bandwidth and uh, frequency range. Um, meanwhile, while we were doing this, um, another new SDR uh, system has um, uh, shown up, which is the RTL SDR, which is not related to the popular TV, an infamous TV station. But the RTL is for real tech in that case. Um, a Taiwanese uh, uh, silicon uh, design house doing all kinds of chips uh, in the multimedia area. And Realtek uh, built uh, uh, a small chip, uh, which is this one here, uh, the RTL, uh, I forgot the, the exact type model number. Mm. And this device um, is intended for, uh, for uh, reception of digital TV. So you buy these, uh, this entire device with a small case, you can buy at any electronic store like MediaMarkt, ThoMarkt, and so on, and they're sold so you can receive DVB-T or a DVB-C or other, but mostly it's DVB-T um, on, uh, on your PC. And the, the chip here implements the ADC and also implements the entire demodulation of MPEG and, and uh, uh, filtering of the uh, MPEG-2 transport stream and then passing the MPEG stream over USB. So it actually does a lot of things in hardware. It's not really a software-defined radio chip at all. It implements a, a DVB-T reception in hardware, but it's possible to disable this entire DVB uh, uh, demodulation in the chip so you can get the raw samples um, and forward the raw samples over USB into your host PC. And uh, some people have figured out <coughs> how to do this, and we uh, created a uh, Osmocom project uh, for RTL SDR, where now you can um, use any of these cheap DVB-T receivers that use this Realtek uh, chip um, and use them as a very, very cheap, sort of $20, 20 euro kind of uh, device for uh, receiving um, any signal again, typically in the range uh, 64 megahertz to at least one gigahertz. The, the upper frequency depends on what uh, tuner chip is used here. Some go up to one gigahertz, 1.5 gigahertz, some even go up to two gigahertz um, of uh, received signal uh, frequency. So this is definitely by far the most cheap soft universal software defined radio that you hardware you can buy. And uh, by using RTL SDR, which you can run on Windows, on macOS, on Linux, it's not even uh, operating system dependent, um, you can get these raw samples and you can feed it into any uh, uh, SDR software that you either write yourself or, of course, uh, the existing implementations like uh, AirProbe for GSM or um, uh, Osmocom GMR or Osmocom Tetra and so on. Um, I think this is very important because it gives technology uh, related to mobile uh, communications into more hands. Um, if, if you have an entry barrier of, you know, $1,000 or something like that, then yes, you know, some people are uh, excited enough and have the, have the, the, the wallet uh, to actually invest in that, um, but still you will miss out on a lot of other people. And uh, if you are uh, hitting a price point of $20, then every student, even only with a mild interest in the topic, is able to afford it. Uh, very easily, and not only in uh, Europe or the US, but also in other countries uh, where wallets are smaller. Um, okay, now another hardware project that we did is Osmocom SimTrace, uh, which you can see in the picture here. It's a small hardware device that gets uh, inserted in between the SIM card and your phone. So. You put this uh, flexible cable uh, adapter instead of the SIM card into your phone, and then you put the actual SIM card into the SIM trace device, and you again have a USB socket and you connect it to a PC. And using that device, you can then do protocol traces of uh, the SIM card uh, protocol between phone and um, uh, SIM card, which again is very interesting for all kinds of security-related analysis. 
Um, and the, uh, so the, the decoding happens in Wireshark. So it's, again, the typical Osmocom project for intercepting any kind of interfaces. We have some kind of hardware or some software-defined radio receiver. Um, we transport uh, the data somehow into Wireshark, and then we implement a Wireshark protocol dissector for the respect protocol. That's a sort of a very uh, general pattern that we follow in a lot of projects. Um, What's fun about this is that the hardware is also capable of doing man in the middle, so it can actually modify the stream between the SIM card and the phone. Um, nobody has used it so far, as, as far as I know, but the hardware has the capability uh, to do so. We don't have any marvelous uh, software that actually uh, uses it at this point. Um, especially in terms of SIM application toolkit and uh, 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 proactive SIM cards, it's very interesting. I mean, not many people know generally that SIM cards can, for example, ask the mobile phone about the GPS position or uh, that they can uh, ask the phone uh, to notify them about uh, measurement values of uh, surrounding cells that are not the cell that you're currently camped to or that uh, a SIM card can actually modify the, the phone number that you have dialed uh, without you knowing that it has been modified. So somebody who can exploit a SIM card and who can, uh, who can um, uh, control the software running on the SIM card, he can do actually many more things to a phone uh, than people would imagine. So a, a rogue SIM card is a very, very um, significant threat because the SIM card can, uh, has call control by SIM, so it can rewrite the phone number. So when you're calling your friend, it may be calling some kind of an interception system, which then calls your friend. Um, you're still speaking with your friend, but you have a man in the middle inserted in between. Um, same goes for SMS. Uh, SIM cards can send and receive uh, SMSs on, by themselves with, with other people without you knowing. Um, SIM cards can, uh, what else can they do? There's a lot of things they can do. Um, they can, ah, SIM cards can even bind to UDP or TCP ports uh, that are reachable over GPRS um, on phones. It's called BIP, Bearer Independent Protocol. And there are many more things that SIM cards can do. It's a very interesting topic to study. Um, you know, uh, also, modern SIM cards are computers themselves. They're not just a small, you know, a small memory card that stores some, some key material. They're real computers in themselves. They have a Java virtual machine. They have a Java runtime environment. Um, you can have uh, multiple applications running on the card in parallel. Operators can download additional program code into the SIM cards remotely. So there's a lot of things that, that happens in that area, which is interesting to have a look at with uh, stuff like SIM trays. Another thing we built, but um, uh, this really only the hardware exists. Uh, software has never been completed, unfortunately. Um, I'm presenting it nevertheless in case somebody's interested. It's a small E1 transceiver that you can use to interface E1 lines because in telecommunication still a lot is happening over TDM uh, um, systems and not over IP. And uh, uh, Especially when you want to tap, for example, an E1 interface or something like that, uh, this is a very nice uh, uh, and inexpensive uh, open hardware design for E1 interface. We also have a number of other software projects which are much higher up the stack and in, in the core network. Uh, they deal with protocols like uh, TCAP, MAP, uh, SCCP, um, and uh, the various different SIGTRAN levels. Um, uh, I guess almost nobody knows about them, and I don't need to go into detail here. Um, this is just uh, basically the protocols that are spoken at the roaming interface between the operators, um, and uh, you can have uh, fun with those in case you have access to such interfaces. There are some other projects which are not Osmocom, which nonetheless I would like to mention in the context of uh, mobile communications. OpenBTS is a project that is not related to OpenBSC, um, even though it sounds sort of similar. Uh, it was developed uh, independently by uh, uh, David Burgess and uh, some co-developers uh, in the US. And it is a bridge between the GSM radio interface and SIP voice over IP telephony on the other side. So it's um, uh, not a BTS in a classical sense. It doesn't speak a lot of the GSM protocols, but it can basically allow you to attach GSM phones to a voice over IP PBX um, and then use them uh, from, uh, from, from that point on. It uses, uh, well, a different SDR hardware, but the primary hardware that people use it with is um, uh, USRP, 
uh, type uh, devices. Um, Okay, there's also AirProbe, which is again not an Osmocom project, but it's a, a software-defined re radio receiver for the GSM radio interface, um, which is more or less abandoned today because you can do the same with uh, the $20 phones. So why would you get a, a, an $800 USRP uh, plus AirProbe, uh, which has better received perform uh, sorry, has that worse uh, received performance than using a $20 phone and and a laptop? So. Uh, it's not really used that much anymore. I also co-started a, a company that is uh, trying to productize some of these uh, open source projects, but I'm skipping on that. Well, where do we go from here? Um, uh, one of our project members, Dieter Spa, has been doing a lot of work with uh, uh, 3G node Bs, which are basically the uh, 3G uh, UMTS base stations. Um, uh, we got a couple of them again from eBay. It's always fascinating what you can find on eBay. Um, and uh, uh, so with uh, both Ericsson and Nokia Siemens networks, Node Bs, um, uh, he's now able to run his own 3G network, not just GSM, uh, what we did so far. Um, we did quite a bit of research into intercepting microwave backhaul links. Um, which is a, a big problem still uh, today because the micro, a lot of the backhaul from the base station to, to the base station controller uh, in GSM networks happens over microwave links. So you have a couple of cell towers located somewhere and then at the cell tower they don't interface uh, uh, fiber optics or uh, cable interface, um, but they actually use a, a microwave point-to-point -point link to some other location in order to save the amount of cabling they need to put to all these cell towers. Especially operators that don't have their own cable infrastructure um, uh, like to do that, of course. Uh, Deutsche Telekom in Germany, they have the cables everywhere, so they probably don't use much microwave, but other operators that don't have these cables uh, are more likely to do so. And um, the problem with GSM is that uh, the encryption, the little uh, insufficient encryption that exists is only on the radio interface to the cell tower. And from the cell tower to the remaining network, there's no encryption whatsoever. Um, and these uh, microwave links, uh, typically they also don't have any encryption whatsoever. Uh, the security relies on uh, using proprietary modulation and encoding techniques um, and the fact that it is di directional radio. So um, you cannot receive it anywhere, but you have to be you know, either in between the link or behind one of the antennas, or which many people forget, side lobes. So if you know anything about antennas, you know that antennas have side lobes. And uh, we looked at the more common Ericsson mini link systems, and they all have pretty strong side lobes at 60 degrees off the beam. So when you're on, on ground, you can receive those uh, very easily. Um, and feed them into uh, the respecting receivers. And the, the fun part about that is that uh, you don't only get a single cell, but if you pick the right microwave link, um, then you get a lot of the cells at the same time, if you somehow, somehow at, a, at a trunk. And then you get all the mobile TANs, you know, transaction numbers, banking numbers of all the people in that area or that region unencrypted. You don't even need to break any crypto anymore. So that's a very funny. Uh, system and banks still believe it's uh, a secure uh, method. Um, yeah, there's some research in GPS simulation and uh, femtocell related stuff and, and other systems, but I don't want to bore you to death and take a couple of questions in the few minutes that we have remaining. <laughs> okay, thank you for this talk. Question over there. Uh, you mentioned uh, several options for uh, receiving uh, arbitrary signals in a broad frequency range. Uh, are there any similar options for transmitting? Um, for transmitting, the options are uh, a little bit more um, limited. Um, the USRPs, of course, uh, the, uh, can transmit as well as they can receive, but that's again the sort of 800 plus dollars uh, range. In cheaper devices, um, I'm not aware of um, uh, many devices that have a reasonable bandwidth uh, and can transmit. Uh, we are planning on an, a stacking board for the Osmo SDR. It's actually why there are so many headers that you can see on the top and so on, is there are additional pins uh, to the FPGA and to the microcontroller 
um, and we intend to have a stacking board at some later point uh, that then can transmit uh, in the same frequency range, but that's just uh, vaporware at this time. It hasn't been implemented yet, but I'm not aware of any cheap... Uh, do, do you have a... Do you want to bring up a cheap uh, uh, transmitting device? No, okay, it's a different question. Yeah, so, sorry, unfortunately, I'm not aware of any transmitters that are wideband and uh, universal and inexpensive. Uh, if I start uh, playing with uh, Osmocom at home, uh, can I expect uh, the police uh, to come to me and ask uh, questions? <laughs> um, it depends on what you do, you know. Um, it's a little bit like buying a hammer. If you use it to hammer nails in the wall, then police will probably not mind. But if you use it to kill somebody, then uh, they will probably mind. Or if you smash the window of your neighbor. So with Osmocom BB, you can do many things that are completely legitimate, like... Uh, you know, making phone calls, sending and receiving SMSs, but you can also do evil things like doing a denial of service attack on the cell, and then, of course, some people might not be very pleased by that. So, uh, generally, I would not be worried. Um, also, if you're, if you're uh, how can I say, uh, very careful, uh, the default, uh, if, if you check out the Osmocom BB source code and you compile the firmware, the default is that all the transmit functionality has been disabled. So in, in the default compile, um, you can only passively uh, listen and receive, and you can never transmit. So there's absolutely no risk in that default uh, uh, configuration. And if you feel more adventurous that you also want to transmit, then you can have to explicitly enable that in the make file and build a version that has the transmit support included. But even with that, as I said, as long as you use it as a normal phone and you're not you know, uh, trying to, to implement denial of service attacks or things like that, I wouldn't be uh, worried generally. We have one question from the RC. Um, a user wants to know when there will be a non-development Osmo SDR and what the estimated price will be. The price will not change. So I, I think it was 175. Uh, I don't actually remember. We just looked at the website, it's 180. Uh, 180, okay, sorry, five euros more. Um, the price will be the same, uh, and the difference uh, between development and non-development version as well, it's basically when, when uh, the firmware and host software is more uh, stable. Um, its progress has been quite slow because the people doing the, I'm not doing, I'm not uh, involved in the hardware design of this project, um, but uh, the people who are, are uh, have been unexpectedly busy in the last couple of months and it's like with many volunteer spare time projects, uh, they are based on, on people donating their time and uh, so I cannot really make a, a strong commitment on schedule here. Yeah, question back there. Yeah, given the, the technologies you've been describing and your expertise, do you think in the long run there would still be a need for uh, mobile operators to have mobile phone networks as such, or is it just a, a sweet dream? I mean, operating things like independent mobile networks, would that be possible one day? Well, um, it is already possible technically today, to some extent. Um, uh, the biggest problem is the legal uh, situation, of course, that uh, the entire way how spectrum regulation and auctioning off uh, mobile communication spectrum and, uh, you know, governments earning billions and billions of, of uh, revenue from, from selling these licenses to commercial uh, uh, network operators. So there's uh, uh, quite a problem in that area to make it a, a widespread uh, phenomenon. Um, so I think uh, we will have um, mobile network operators uh, for many years to come. Um, I think the biggest danger or the biggest question that we will see in the next couple of years is will we, since LTE is now a technology that doesn't really have any telephony support. LTE is a data communication system and if you want to do voice, it's voice over IP that you do on top of it. Um, and there are multiple different ways to do that, uh, including Volga and Volti and many different uh, schemes for that. Now the question will be whether the operators are more becoming an ISP kind of uh, a business or whether they succeed in um, still you know, restricting the kind of services people use and restricting uh, uh, what type of voice over IP operator they will be able to use over that universal data network and, and those kind of things. So I think there will be a lot of struggle and uh, about power and, and controlling what the subscriber can do and what he cannot do. Um, I think I recently heard about such a community network, I think in Netherlands or something like that, I don't know. 
Maybe you have to Google it or something. <laughs> Yes, though, as far as I know, it's not about uh, having actual infrastructure. It's more one of these virtual uh, mobile operators. Okay. And uh, Netherlands also is a special case in that they have certain GSM frequencies which are license-free. So um, in, in the Netherlands, actually, as far as I know, in Europe at least, it's the only country that has some GSM, a specific part of the GSM 1800 spectrum is used, uh, can, you can use it uh, license-free, like Wi-Fi. Um, and uh, uh, people are actually permitted to run their own base stations there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I will repeat the question. Yeah, uh, sorry, and we get back to the question in, in a minute. Uh, so the question was uh, whether you can, in the Netherlands, you can set up your own mobile network. Yes, you can. Um, and you don't need any specific uh, permission or anything. There's a couple of frequencies for uh, low power private uh, GSM networks um, in, in the Netherlands, yes. Oh, the question back there, yeah. Here. Um, mobile industry is uh, famous for its patent wars. You've been doing this for, uh, or since uh, 2009, if I understood it right. Um, can you report if you encountered any patent problems or do you expect to encounter any problems? Uh, how do you prepare, <laughs> you and the community? Well, um, in terms of GSM, actual real GSM, as I said, the technology was developed in the late 1980s and patents only have 20 years lifetime. So as long as you work with GSM, you don't have to worry about patents because all the applicable patents on actual GSM have expired. Now, if you're talking about uh, 3G or LTE or something like that, of course, the situation is completely different. Um, nevertheless, I would be seriously surprised uh, to see any uh, patent litigation against uh, the various open source projects um, because, uh, how can I say, they're not a threat in terms of uh, market share or competition or anything like that. It's just a couple of people doing stuff that they like, but it's not a commercial threat to the equipment manufacturers and it's unlikely to ever be one. Um, and at the same time, it's not that you can get any money from them. So you see the large patent lawsuits always against uh, competition, of course, and you see it in the case that there is a lot of money to be gained, um, but uh, from a couple of random developers, you can't really extort much money. Um, so from a commercial point of view, I think it's very unattractive. Not yet? Ah, I, I'm quite, ser quite certain it, it will never be, uh, so. So uh, there is no, if this problem should occur, there is no solution for this right now? No, there, I, I think there never is any solution against software patents. Um, the only way is to, to get rid of them. It's the only solution that I can ever think of. So there are two more questions from the RSC. One is, uh, do you know anything from uh, printing or making SIM cards for research on a low budget? Um, making SIM cards on a low budget? Uh, yes, for research. Well, the question is what exact, uh, question, my counter question would be what exactly do you want to uh, make or what do you want to build? If all you need is a SIM card where you can manipulate all the data, like the key material, the, the identities that are stored, the content of all the files and so on, uh, you can buy those cards for like three euros uh, uh, per card and then you can, you can program all the data that's on the card and uh, uh, write to them. That's easy, but if you actually want to write the, the card operating system on the card itself, because there's a lot of software that runs inside the SIM card itself, then you need a, um, a processor smart card uh, that you can program which uh, has not been easy so far to do, but uh, we are working on this, and it's the Osmo COS project, uh, the Osmocom card operating system. There's no actual card operating system yet, but we found a Chinese uh, cheap uh, smart card chip that we can buy and where we get all the documentation from the manufacturer without NDA. So um, based on that, you can also um, uh, build uh, uh, your own card operating system. Hey, then there is another. Uh, do you support DRM, which here is Digital Radio Mundial in Osmocom code, and can you share some perspective on it, DRM versus HD radio? Um, we do not have any code for uh, Digital Radio Mundial, which is 
I, I just think it's so hilarious that they chose uh, uh, DM, uh, uh, yeah. anyway, uh, DRM as, a, as an ac uh, acronym. No, we don't have any code for that, but there are a number of projects that you can find, uh, open source projects for transmitting and receive, for at least receiving, if not transmitting as well, I'm not so sure. But you can find a lot of D uh, DRM receiver uh, uh, code if you look. We haven't looked into that. Uh, we, we generally have not implemented any broadcast standards. We've not implemented DAB or not uh, DVB or any of that, um, uh, these, these broadcast systems. We're more interested in, in bi-directional communication systems. And there just was a thank you for the last question on the operating system on SIM cards. That was exactly the question. <laughs> so more questions here? Yes. Okay. Uh, yes, does uh, the software stacks in the GSM have, that, have they have those passed uh, official compliance testing or other standardized tests? There are no official compliance tests or other standardized tests. Um, the funny part about um, uh, radio spectrum regulation and uh, general regulation in Europe regarding uh, radio equipment is the R and TTE directive, um, and uh, it only mandates compliance uh, with on a physical layer. So the protocol stack is never subject to any legally required uh, certification or something like that. The, the, the legal mandatory requirements uh, relate to the radio itself, the spectrum mask, uh, out of band uh, transmissions, sensitivity of your receiver and all these kind of things. So that is indeed uh, uh, something that uh, is required by the respective uh, harmonized European norms, but on layer two or higher, there's no um, no, no requirement whatsoever, uh, because the, the, I think the European Union is only worried about people actually uh, causing radio interference and so on. They're not worried about uh, people sending malformed messages, uh, you know. Okay, thank you. I have a question. Uh, it's about the phone that can be used as a baseband, the 20 euro phone. I guess that's the Motorola C123. Correct. And I was watching a talk yesterday where somebody was explaining how they had how they had gotten into the, um, the lowest level of code in the DSP, and it was very impressive, but they mentioned that when they, in their uh, efforts to make a base station with the phone, which succeeded, they were only able to receive on one time slot at a time, and that when they would try to receive on multiple time slots, they would just get zeros, and it was very frustrating, and that there was obviously nowhere to turn do you know anything about that? And uh, I'm just asking since you seem to be know something about that phone. Well, um, Sylvain Monod, who gave the talk yesterday um, in Hamburg, uh, definitely knows most about it because he's the Osmocom BV project member doing uh, most of the work in that area. Um, I'm not sure which specific problem he was, uh, he was talking about. Generally, the problem on a more abstract level, you always have a problem in that a phone, when it works as a phone, never has to receive on more than one time slot. Um, and also, uh, because when you make a voice call, that voice call uses one time slot out of the eight time slots that there are. And uh, you, the DSP, the capacity, the, the CPU power and so on is designed in a way that you can uh, decode that one voice call. And you don't necessarily even have the DSP power to decode multiple time slots because it's not needed in regular phone uh, operation. So that may be uh, uh, one of the uh, problems um, in, in, in that area. Okay, and speaking about time slots, we are approaching our next time slot for the next speaker. Thank you again. Thanks.